Well, hey, welcome to Diamond Dialogue, the short-form interview show for members of the chat realm. Uh, we're here at episode number 10 with Gordon McLeod. Say hello. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Hey. Uh, nice to see you all, you Diamond Club folks. <laughs> well, it's good to have you on. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. We'll just jump right That's in with the problem. questions. Oh, yeah, of course. We'll jump right in with the questions here. Who the hell are you? We'll cover that a little bit. And how did you get here? Okay, uh, well, I'm a writer and game designer, kind of an ex-game designer. I'm uh, focusing on the writing these days. And as for how I got here, well, first there was the Big Bang. Then a bunch of other stuff happened. <laughs> uh, and then I joined Twitter and started stalking the profile of this guy you may have heard of, Leo Laporte. Sure, sure. And uh, through him, I discovered a couple of people that have made an enormous impact in my life. That was Callie Lewis of Geek Beat, Geek Brief at the time, actually, and right. Dr. Kiki. Oh, yes. Love Dr. And, Kiki. Yeah. Dr. Kiki is actually sort of the direct response to how I got here because she introduced me to Twid, even though I already knew Leo kind of from the screensaver days. Oh, yeah. Uh, she was, you know, you may remember she was kind of a regular correspondent on Tech News Today way back in the day. Yeah, for and so that brought me there and introduced me to Tom and to Schwood and to Veronica. <clears throat> Sorry. And to all these other people that, uh, you know, we know and love in the Diamond Club. And oh, sure. that got me to NSFW. And, yeah, that was kind of a rocky journey getting into NSFW a little late in the game. But, <laughs> a lot of in you know, jokes. you kind of pick up on the, yeah, yeah, the in-jokes. <laughs> I still have to get all of them out. But, uh, but it was good through... Dr. Kiki and Casey McKinnon, I learned about NSFW and got into that, and here I am. Excellent. Well, we're glad to have you here. I think this next question is kind of self-explanatory, but maybe you can go <laughs> into more why. But what are the origins of your chat handle? Or more, more to your point, why didn't you pick something more original? <laughs> uh, well, I used to have something a little more original. It actually wasn't that much more original. I went with McLeod G originally. Oh, okay. And Callie Lewis, for those of you who don't know, I actually, I am a member of the Geek Beat staff and I work with Callie and John and all of them. And Callie used to give me a really hard time about my handle because McLeod G is impossible for anybody who's not familiar with my name to pronounce. Oh, the only sure. person in history who has ever gotten it correct the first time is Tom Merritt. <laughs> so... He's uh, good with but that. He's awesome that way, so you know, you kind of expect that from him. So yeah, she used to always give me hell. And so finally I decided if I'm gonna go ahead with this whole writing thing that I'm trying to do, I probably want to use my real name as, you know, just a recognition thing. Yeah. And so I switched over to that and I've been using it on most things ever since. Oh, excellent. Yeah, mine my, my problem with my my real name is too common. <laughs> like if you search for Alex Hanna, there's like 500 results before you get to anything even close to me. So I made up a chat handle and and that's what I go by now and it's easy, easy, easy to find me now. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to mostly sort of, you know, get past most of the really stupid, embarrassing chat handles I used when I was a teenager and stuff like that, mostly in the BBS days, which made it a lot easier to get rid of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, not so many survived into the internet age. Right. Yeah, I think we all had stupid chat handles as high schoolers or middle schoolers even. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's excellent. So here's a, here's a good one that tells a lot about you and a lot about your, your TV and, and movie watching habits. You're stranded on a desert island. You only get three movies, but you get this awesome unlimited powered, solar powered DVD player. What movies do you get to keep? Only three oh, of them. Oh, boy. Only three specific movies. I can't extend that into franchises, can I? No, no, no. You have to pick one. You have to pick the, the individual one. I mean, you could pick, like, you know, all three Lord of the Rings or something, but that's that's all three done in one shot. Although that wouldn't yeah. really be a bad pick. That's nine hours of movies. So, you know. Actually, that's pretty tempting, especially if you go for the extended editions. I think I might make that one of my picks. The full <laughs> extended Lord of the Rings. For all three so of them? So that's a good 12 hours there. Yeah. 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 So that's 12 hours. That's a uh, yeah. That's that's pretty good. And if you, especially if you got the DVDs, you have the the um, all the extra uh, the extras and stuff that they do. So you yeah. it's, you actually probably have a good full day of watching without having to to repeat anything. As kind of an extra bonus, I have never managed to finish watching the full extended Fellowship of the Ring. 
Or, oh, really? Uh, sorry, uh, the, the, not the Fellowship. The third one. The Return of the King. Oh, Return of the King, yeah. Man, I've, I haven't rewatched those movies in a long time. I should, I should go back and rewatch them. I'm kind of it's disappointed always, with know, The Hobbit, to be honest. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've seen the first one. It was okay. I don't know. It kind of lost something over the originals. Yeah, definitely. And, and it feels a little <clears throat> bit repeat. You know, we did this. We did this in the yeah. in the other one, you know. Just there's no ring it's on it. There's also a bit of a tone really. shift, and it seems like a lot more CG went into it. So Yeah, it almost feels more like it was meant for young younger kids. Which I guess the original Which book. Which does make kind of, sense. Yeah, the original the book, book kind of meant more of that. a kid's book. Yeah, whereas the Lord of the Rings books were a little bit more adult oriented, but you could still get into them from, you know, middle school yeah. age on and stuff, so no, that, that's an excellent pick for movies. I, I do like the original Lord of the Rings movies, and probably half because I, I read the books like 20 times in middle school. Yeah. So. Well, that's excellent. Oh, one of the things I love most about those is the fact that yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if this is a kind of a controversial take or something, but I've always felt that the movies improved on the books in a lot of ways. I mean, there's no denying the impact that Tolkien's work has had on fantasy in particular and literature in general, but... He was a human being, and human beings are not perfect. No. <laughs> and those books are not perfect. And there were a lot of places where the filmmakers were actually able to improve the flow of the story, especially hugely. So I've always really loved the movies for that. No, oh, excellent. All right, so we'll move on to the, the next telling question. <laughs> uh, okay. You're given a superpower, or you, you gain a superpower, whichever way to look at it. What's your superpower, and what's the first thing you do with it? Oh, uh, okay. I actually had to prepare for this one a bit. Um, back when Sword and Laser was putting their anthology together, I wrote a story that is the basis of my answer. And it's about this inventor who creates a pair of quantum divergence spectacles. Hmm. And what that is, is it allows you to see... You know the sort of sliders concept of alternate histories and stuff? Sure. Where uh, quantum differences create very subtle variations in sort of, you could call it the timeline, but it's really more parallel Earths. Right. These spectacles would allow you to see into those different possibilities in your future and choose between them. Oh, interesting. So I would want the super ability to see that and be able to make choices. It's kind of like so quantum could, leap, uh, kind of like quantum yeah. leap, but being able to see where you're going first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd like to be able to see what's coming up and see. Uh, no, I don't think I really want to be hit by a bus today. I'm going to go this way instead, <laughs> kind of thing. I think I'm going to take the other way to work today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that, that's yeah. brilliant. So what's what's but, the very uh, first thing you do with them? Oh, uh, the very first thing I do is, well, if I have the power the way I wrote it in the story, I would probably go insane because. It's too much information for the brain to handle. But assuming that's not a problem, then I think I would just start maneuvering my way into a future where, you know, the whole writing thing is a spectacular success and everything works out nicely and maybe do some good along the way for the world. No, you're such a nice guy. (laughs) I'd go, I'd go like rob a bank or something. (laughs) Screw you guys. I'm out. (laughs) Uh, You know, it's that whole Canadian thing. I'm kind of constrained in the way I can react to things. I have to be nice. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. Sorry for dis- being disappointingly nice. <laughs> well, excellent. So what do you, what do you play in these days for, for games? You playing some video games or maybe board games with the family or something? Oh, way more than I should. Um, <laughs> Minecraft has been consuming my life on a regular basis since 2010. And I expect that to continue for a little more than the next week. Then The Sims 4 will take its turn and start consuming my life for a little while. And then after that, Civilization Beyond Earth is going to hit, and that will take over. And then I'll probably go back to Minecraft at some point. It seems to be a cycle. I can't get away from Minecraft forever. Interesting. So you kind of like the uh, the building type games? I love sandbox games, and I think that's because of the whole writing thing. Uh, oh, yeah. I like the ability to sort of create stories for places that I've constructed myself and just sort of have the freedom of imagination to create whatever comes to mind. Excellent. You, you ever play SimCity? I, I, I'm really into SimCity, so... Yeah, it's not just The Sims for me. It's that entire franchise all the way back to the very original SimCity. I am oh, completely excellent. hooked on the entire thing. 
I remember a game I want them to bring back because I remember it from middle school was um, Sim Ant. That was so fun. Yes. <laughs> it yes. was so much different. Sim Ant was amazing. I know, and it's so much different than the rest of the games because you know, it's a little bit more controlling the society rather than just building the the place where everyone lives. You know, but yeah. Yeah, I've, I've thoroughly yeah. enjoyed the, the latest SimCity. Uh, it's, it, and I should say, it's since mods have come out. Because, like, unidirectional roads, do, having one-way roads, is the biggest thing I would harp on for, like, the first year I played the game. Because <laughs> I'm like, wow. I need one-way roads to construct intersections. Uh, or, or, you know, okay, like, you may have just changed my gaming future, because I have not played it since mods came out. I haven't played the standalone, not online version so oh, yeah. now I might have to revisit that too. Yeah, I'm not gonna find the time for all of this. <laughs> Welcome to my world. I, I have like yeah. 900 hours into SimCity, uh, 2013, and I played oh, SimCity this... 4 probably about that much too. <laughs> yeah. So oh, this uh, latest one is the one I played the least, even though I love it, just because the city size kind of. Yeah. And yeah. there's a mod. For it had that problems. Now. It was wonderful, but it had problems. Let's yeah, put it that way. There's a mod for the city size too now, which is really awesome. And and, and it's not perfect because the, the modding community did it and it wasn't intended to be supported originally by, by Maxis, but they have yeah. found ways around it and you can get, you know, kind of broken out of the city size and oh, it's so cool. Good. Check it out and, you know, I'll, you can watch some of my videos or we can talk later and yeah. I'll show you some cool stuff. So Yeah, yeah, yeah that would be great. I'd love that. Oh, for sure. So, speaking of creating your own places and, and telling stories about them, if you could move to any planet, real or, you know, fictional or anything, what would it be and what would your house be like? Mm. I've watched some of the other episodes of this and people have talked about moving to places like Hoth or, uh, you know, other cold places, and I'm definitely in that camp. I think I might have to, you know... Uh, move to Hoth myself and sort of set up a little snow palace that I could live in. I can't deal with the heat very well. So uh, as long as we had a good internet connection, I would be perfectly fine there. Yeah, I think we, we'd have a little uh, a colony of Diamond Club people on, on Hoth so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was a little surprised to see this recurring theme. Like, no, I can't deal with heat. No, I can't deal with heat. But uh, no, it's good to know I'm not alone out there. Oh, that's awesome. See, I'm kind of the other way around. I don't really like the cold, but I don't like being super hot and humid either. So, like, I, I don't think I can move, live on, like, Hoth or Endor or anything. And I wouldn't like Tatooine either. There's too much sand, so I'm not sure. Yeah. I'd, I'd have to pick. I, I, I honestly don't know what my answer to that question would be. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, excellent. That's, that's definitely almost... Hoth for me. I'm sorry? Uh, definitely Hoth for me. Excellent. So that's all the regular questions, but you've actually alluded to it earlier. You work for, uh, or you've been um, doing some writing projects. So tell, tell us about that. Okay, well, one of the next projects that I have in my queue is a rewrite of that same story, the Quantum Divergence one, because I wrote that for the anthology, and it was not accepted, and that was disappointing, but at the same time, in hindsight, I'm glad, because I didn't do a very good job with it. Oh, sure. I had this, what I think of at least, as a fantastic premise. And then I took it absolutely nowhere in the story. It turned into sort of a generic chase. And that was a little bit boring. And so I think I could do much better. Okay. So I'm planning a rewrite of that. Um, in addition, I'm working on sort of a semi-sequel to a book that I wrote a couple years back. Um, it's one of my more popular ones so far. But uh, this new one is based around the sort of the concept of a colony ship which you know it's been done a little bit before but i want to explore kind of the idea of how would humanity and how would individuals sort of adjust to this concept of living out uh just years and years and centuries and millennia without you know without really the possibility of personally reaching your destination but just existing on this ship for the purpose of allowing your descendants, basically, to make this arrival and kind of knowing that you yourself are really kind of a placeholder in a way. Mm. So I want to explore how do you, how do you really, how do you cope with that? Because that's kind of a, it, it's sort of a depressing sort of thought, you know? And what kind of strategies would you use? What kind of pressures would that put on you? How would you live your life and how would you deal with it? 
Yeah, that's, so that's really I, interesting. I kind of want to explore that. Yeah, I, I like yeah, the... So uh, that's, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, well, I was just going to say that's the uh, that's that's one of the ones that I'm working on right now. And uh, the, the, the rewrite will be coming a little bit down the line, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've always loved that generational ship kind of kind of idea because currently yeah. that's that's about the only thing we've got to actually get anywhere else that's that's far away, you know. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. heck, even Mars is, is what they're talking like two years or something to, to to get there and or four years or something like that to get there from Earth. And I was like, it just seems like it, it shouldn't be shouldn't take that long. But I guess it, it really is pretty darn far away. So. You well, know, it's not only far away, but it's also moving continuously as you're trying to get there. So right, well, like everything else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excellent. So, so you've got your writing, and you're also saying you do stuff for Geekbeat. What What do you do for Geekbeat? Uh, yeah. Uh, back when Kelly ended Geek Reef and started up uh, Geekbeat, they put out a call for bloggers, and I responded. And somehow conned them into thinking that I'd be a good match, and I've been with them ever since. Nice. Um, Initially, just as a blogger, now I'm one of the site editors, and uh, yeah, so I cover a lot of different stuff, mostly sort of science and tech related stuff. But lately, they've been wanting more game coverage, which I've been more than happy to give them. So I'm doing a lot of game reviews and stuff like that as well. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Oh, that and, sounds uh, fun. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really Most cool. Most recent. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying that sounds that sounds really cool to work for Geekbeat. Yeah, it's uh, really fantastic, especially right now. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Texas, down in Dallas, Fort Worth area, where the headquarters is. And they just moved to a new building that they bought. They used to be in a leased office space, mm. which put serious limitations on what they were able to do inside with regards to lighting and sets and all that. They couldn't really make any permanent alterations. Exactly. So they bought this enormous building now. And they've set it up in ways kind of... Similar to when Twit bought the brick house, mm -hmm. uh, they've built their own studio space. They've got lots of room. They're doing all kinds of amazing stuff, and they brought me down there to be part of the grand opening and uh, help set up for the party and everything. And it was just this amazing blast. They've got so much great stuff. So yeah, if uh, if you're a Geek Beat fan, it's a really great time to be checking out what they're doing because yeah. things are ramping up really quickly right that right about now. Oh, that's that's very cool. Yeah, I, I used to watch a lot more Geek Beat, and then I've shuffled podcatchers so many times. I, I must have lost copy of the. I, I've lost a lot actually, which is which is crazy because I I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I, I guess it's not that crazy to to think that I would lose a couple in the in the shuffle, but I need to re-add yeah. that. <laughs> but speaking of Geek yeah. Beat, we all we all know Kelly Lewis is super super happy and perky on the air. Is she is she uh, as upbeat in real life as as she is in the recordings? Mostly, I think people would actually be surprised at how kind of laid back and reserved she can be. Hmm. Uh, she's usually really really good at putting on that public sort of bubbly face, but uh, it's not always there. Uh, I mean, she's always super nice. That part never ever changes, but. I think she's actually a lot more of a sort of an introvert than people realize. People think that what you see on camera is what you get all the time. Hmm. And I don't think anybody, any human being is capable of being that out there all the time. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, I can't even imagine what it would take to maintain that kind of energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, she does a pretty good job of it, but you know, everybody's human. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Well, that's excellent. So, what do you, what do you got to plug for us? Uh, let us know where, where we can find your stuff and, and all that good stuff. Uh, you can usually find me around Twitter at Gordon McLeod. And, of course, uh, you can find me on the Geek Beat blog. I post every now and then. Okay. So, you'll find my reviews and stuff there. And, so, yeah. And, and, of course, the Diamond Club itself. And Diamond Club. And you've got your um, your books. Uh, your book information is up on fictioninprobable.com. Yes, Excellent. thank you for reminding me. I was about to completely forget to plug that again. <laughs> no, that's all right. You, you got so much stuff to plug. I'm sure it's it's, <laughs> it's easy to forget. Yeah, so stuff. all the stuff that I write is at fictionimprobable.com. It's a kind of a site that's in a perpetual state of uh, reorganization as I try to figure out what's the best way to put stuff up. And uh, so you can see the stuff that I'm writing as I write it there. And I've got sections where you can find the completed things and free ebooks or even paid ebooks if you actually feel like kicking me a buck or two things Excellent. like that oh that's very amazing 
And of course, you can find all the Diamond Dialogue stuff at uh, the Diamond Dialogue website, which is tinvec.com slash dd. That's two Ds. Got to make a little, little shortened URL there, so it's easier to figure out rather than having to remember to put the dash in there. And uh, it's been great having you, Gordon Cloud. We're going to let the music play us out. And thank you very much for joining me. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Oh, of course. It's been great to have you. <laughs> <laughs> I need to figure out like a... <laughs> <laughs>